all to the uh, Dogwood Center on this uh, lovely, beautiful Thursday night. Unfortunately, the, the goings on in the world uh, these days aren't so lovely as, uh, as beautiful as the weather was today. And uh, once again, we're very uh, fortunate to uh, to have uh, Comrade uh, Miguel Figueroa with us. Uh, he's, uh, he's currently on the, the last leg, I guess, of a Western tour uh, of Canada. And uh, it's been a very busy tour for him. Uh, as you know, if you've, uh, uh, and everybody has been following current events, there's been uh, a lot happening recently, not just in the world, but also with our party. And, uh, and uh, Comrade Miguel uh, is going to probably be touching on a, on a lot of the events, but more, most importantly, I think he'll be talking about the world situation uh, and uh, the question of, of peace in the world today. Um, when uh, people have been phoning me, and uh, as was pointed out, uh, said on the little circular, <coughs> we mailed out, phone George and ask for details. <laughs> well, one of the details I was asked today is, how long is he going to speak? <laughs> because if he's going to be speaking on, on the, the war in Kosovo, and the Elections Act, and uh, the... Uh, what's the other one? <laughs> all the things that are going on, he's going to need at least <coughs> four hours. And I said, well, yeah, well, he's prepared to talk for four hours. <laughs> Anyways, I don't think it's going to be four hours, but uh, there certainly is a lot of things to uh, to talk about these days. Uh, there's a lot happening, and, um, and I think uh, it's going to be a very interesting evening. We're going to first listen to uh, Comrade Miguel, uh, to his speech. And then we'll have, uh, I don't think we'll we'll take a break because uh, we don't want to, it takes a long time to get people back in, but we'll have a little break where people can shuffle around and stretch and have a few announcements, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. And then, of course, people are, are welcome to, to stay around and visit uh, uh, for a while afterwards. So, comrades and friends, I'd like you to join me in welcoming uh, Comrade Miguel Figueroa back to uh, Vancouver once again. <laughs> <coughs> well, thank you, George, and uh, good, ev good evening, everyone, um, comrades and friends. Uh, I, I, I'm not planning, I want to tell you right away, I'm not planning to speak for four hours, but just in case I do, would uh, some people lock the doors and uh, <laughs> keep you all here? Um, as always, uh, I'm very pleased to be back in Vancouver, especially under such uh, balmy and sunny conditions. <coughs> I want to lay to rest... Uh, a rumor that's been circulating, however, that I'm somehow responsible for this good weather. Um, as flattering as that is, it's, it's, it's absolutely not true. There's no scientific evidence to, uh, to uphold that. However, uh, there is a disturbing correlation between my departure from places and the onset of bad weather. Um, <laughs> uh, I was in St. John's a few weeks ago, and it was unseasonably warm and sunny, and like within an hour or two of my departure from, uh, from the rock, uh, Stormfront moved in and dumped 35 centimeters of snow, <laughs> and uh, they're still cursing me up there. I'd like to think they're cursing me because uh, I shouldn't have left, but they're probably cursing me for having come in the first place. But <laughs> in, in any case, uh, those of you who are inclined to believe that sort of uh, sort of thing um, and want to know when to batten down the hatches, uh, I'm leaving Sunday morning at 8:40. <laughs> <laughs> but more seriously, though, uh, comrades and friends. When we uh, first decided to undertake uh, this tour uh, of uh, Western Canada, and I've also uh, been to some uh, locations in the East, <coughs> um, we had some discussion about what kind of topics that I could deal with, and one of the uh, topical questions at the time was to give a report back to uh, our members and our friends about a, a very important delegation that we undertook um, last November um, to uh, East and South Asia, and particularly to visit Vietnam and Laos and China uh, to uh, um, find out more about the situation in these socialist countries and the problems that they face, and more importantly, the, the, the future prospects for socialism, uh, especially under the new international conditions that exist. <coughs> but of course, uh, events have, uh, have um, a way of intervening, and certainly, uh, since we first uh, planned this uh, tour, uh, events important events, very serious events, not only for our class and uh, working people in this country, but for all Canadians, and in fact, for the 
humanity as a whole have intervened. And so I'm going to not discuss, uh, with your agreement and indulgence, the trip to Asia. However, I do want to point out uh, to you uh, that certainly during the question and answer period and discussion period, uh, we, we can discuss that and also uh, that finally, after some delay, the <coughs> report of the delegation, the full report of the de delegation has now been published. And I brought a, a, a kind of a, a, an advance number of copies, not very many. There's about eight or ten copies here of the report. But of course, there will be many more that will be available from the office here and from, excuse me, the central office in Toronto. And I encourage uh, all of you to take a look at that report. It's a, it's a very interesting and very important uh, um, matter that it addresses. So I want to turn now to uh, the main um, topic that uh, I'd like to speak to you about tonight, and uh, I think that is very important for us to discuss collectively uh, and to take action on. And uh, there are a number of uh, questions I'd like to discuss in that connection, but I want to start with what we consider our party and central committee consider to be the absolute most important question at this juncture. And that, of course, is the events in the Balkans, the war of aggression that NATO has unleashed against the people of Yugoslavia. <coughs> you know, several months before the onset of the war, uh, our party uh, issued a dire warning about the uh, growing likelihood that uh, NATO, and in the first place, U.S. imperialism, would launch aggression uh, in the Balkans and uh, particularly against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And within hours of the bombs falling and the cruise missiles uh, firing, uh, our party, Central Committee, issued a statement condemning the war and calling it illegal, unconscionable, and totally unjustified. That was our position then, and all events, all developments since that time have, uh, in our view, uh, not only justified, uh, but uh, uh, amplified that uh, position that uh, we have taken and we continue to advance. And of the need to mobilize the Canadian people in their thousands and in their millions to build a powerful peace movement to say no to this war, to say no to Canada's, Canada's participation in it, to call for the CF-18s to come back to Canada and to fight for a peaceful negotiated settlement to this crisis. And we're very heartened by the fact that although in the first days of the onset of this war, um, communists and certainly members of the Serbian community itself in Canada were just about the only forces to, to uh, take a firm position against the NATO aggression. But since that time, a whole number of organizations have uh, found their feet, so to speak, on this issue and have spoken out. And I don't uh, want to give you the exhaustive list, but just to point out a few uh, particularly important organizations. Um, the National Action Committee on the Status of Women has taken a very forthright position. The Canadian Peace Alliance has taken a very, very good position. Uh, WILF, uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and several other peace groups have come out strongly against the war. Uh, the Green Party in Canada has taken a very positive position against this aggression. And just today, and those of you who uh, were watching, um, I guess it was News World um, this, uh, this morning, will know that uh, 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 earlier today, uh, leaders from the Canadian Council of Churches from the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Anglican Church, United Church of Canada, uh, and the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Quakers, and so on, uh, met with Chrétien and gave a, a, uh, a common message to Chrétien that the bombing must stop. This is a very, very important development. Uh, we could say it's overdue, but it has now taken place, and this will help to build a broad movement of the Canadian people against, against the war. But having said that, the fact remains that still there are too many who are still confused on this question, or disoriented by the mass propaganda that has proliferated the airwaves, and, and or have been neutralized by it to the extent to which they privately are worried about what's happening, privately disagree with what's going on, but somehow are having difficulty speaking out 
against this, uh, this action. So therefore, it's very, very important uh, for all of us, and all of, uh, all of us, uh, not only in this room, but all of the progressive forces uh, and uh, peace forces, to clarify what is actually taking place. And at the expense of going over questions which you probably, uh, and, 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 and matters that you're probably already very familiar with, I want to deal with some of those main points. First of all, our party has uh, called this action illegal. And that is probably the easiest place to start. It is on the basis of all appropriate international law in violation of the, the rights of all countries, of all peoples, uh, to sovereignty and to territorial integrity. And I could ream off for you all of the references from the UN Charter, Article 2, Article 27, some of the other um, uh, declarations of international law dealing with this. In 1970, for instance, it was the Declaration of the Principles of International Law. In 1975, the Helsinki Final Act, people will be familiar with, which guaranteed the inviolability of all of the borders in Europe. In fact, a whole body of international law which stipulates that all countries, all peoples have the right to national sovereignty and that it can be violated only under the strictest of conditions and with the agreement of the United Nations and the Security Council. Of course, none of that has happened in this case. And you know, before the refugee crisis became the rallying point to try to justify this war, in the build-up to the launching of this aggression, what was the main issue that was used? It was the fact that the Yugoslav government refused to sign the peace treaty, the Rambouille peace treaty. Well, the Rambouille peace process itself is illegal. There was a treaty, an international treaty, approved many years ago, called the Vienna Treaty. In that treaty, it explicitly, explicitly says that any agreement, any treaty between sovereign states, which is the signature to which is obtained through the use or the threat of use of force, is illegal and null and void. And yet, isn't that exactly what was happening in, 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 in France? Wasn't it exactly holding a gun to the head of the Yugoslav government, sign or we bomb. Very explicitly. It wasn't even a veiled threat. It was very explicit. <coughs> well, we also said that this action is unconscionable. And it's unconscionable, not least because as an illegal action, as a violation of international law, it is leading to the destruction of a society, to the murdering of uh, innocent men, women, and children in their homes, and the destruction of their infrastructure on an unparalleled basis, the so-called collateral damage, which uh, is as Orwellian doublespeak as you can imagine. Schools have been bombed. Hospitals have been destroyed. Residential areas have been attacked. And we know just recently a passenger train was bombed. And just yesterday, uh, the, a convoy of Albanian, Kosovar Albanian refugees themselves uh, were attacked. But of course, in war, people die. And with every war, by the way, more and more non combatants die. That is the logic of modern warfare. And if it's illegal, technically, well, so be it. But what does imperialism hang its hat on? It was necessary to act unilaterally. It was necessary to risk the death of innocent civilians because the action itself is justified. And this is the hardest nut for people to crack. And this is the main target of uh, the mass propaganda, which uh, we're all subjected to. So I want to deal with that question uh, at a bit more length. First of all, we are being told, and the Canadian people and people around the world are being told, that this is uh, what is transpiring in Kosovo province 
is a legitimate liberation movement for sovereignty and for independence. There is no question that there, are, uh, there is a national minority which constitutes a majority of the population in Kosovo province, and that they have national rights, and that their rights need to be respected and reflected uh, um, uh, within um, uh, the Yugoslav Federation. This point, by the way, has already been conceded by the Yugoslav government. And it was even offered long before the first bomb started to drop, and more recently again restated by the Yugoslav government. But we need to note certain questions. The history of Kosovo and its relationship to Serbia is not a new phenomenon. As a matter of fact, if you go back in your history books to 1389, there was the Battle of Blackfield, where the Serbian army was actually defeated uh, and that the, the Kosovo province was grabbed by the Ottoman Empire and incorporated into that empire. And prior to that, it was always part of Serbia. And they occupied that, by the way, for four centuries. During that time, there was ethnic cleansing that took place, not in the modern version, but uh, uh, in, in, those con in, in those conditions. And more recently, during the Second World War, those of you who remember the history of the Second World War will know that the, in Yugoslavia, there was the most um, um, well-organized and successful resistance to fascism anywhere in Eastern Europe, led by communists and uniting not only Serbs, but Slovenians and Croatians and other left and democratic forces under the leadership of the Communist Party and Marshal Tito. And that they were so successful that they pinned down seven full divisions of the Nazis for uh, the greater part of the duration of the war. But during that period of time, the Italian fascists moved into Albania and occupied Albania and collabor in collaboration with Albanian fascist elements, and later on with the Nazi occupation, moved in and seized part of Kosovo province. And when the Nazis and the fascists gained control of Kosovo, they undertook another round of ethnic cleansing and drove out 200,000 Serbs and imported, brought into the area 300,000 Albanians. All of this is well documented. I want to say a bit about the role of the KLA itself, because it's being presented as a righteous um, national liberation movement, freedom fighters for the cause of the Albanian people, and suggest to you that the KLA is a terrorist organization, organized, funded, armed, and financed by imperialism and by the CIA, that they are directly involved in the drug trade. This is well documented in Europe. As a matter of fact, the KLA for several years has, uh, 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 has been under investigation, or in recent years, has been under investigation by several police uh, departments in Northern Europe, including in Sweden and in Germany, as the main conduit for heroin into Northern Europe, and has all of the aspects reminiscent of the Iran Contragate affair, you know, drugs for money, for weapons, under the auspices and the watchful eye of the CIA. And there are reports that, in fact, and even admissions, by the way, that NATO today has liaison officers in the field working hand in hand with the KLA uh, commandos. And that before the war started, it's so very uncertain now what exactly is happening and all of the bloodshed and, uh, and uh, atrocities of, on various sides is being committed in Kosovo now. But before the war had started, that the KLA actually was responsible for killing more Albanians than they were Serbs, Albanians who supported uh, uh, unity with the rest of Yugoslavia and were accused of being collaborationalists. On the question of atrocities, I think it will be some time before all of the truth is out on this question, but I, we wouldn't be surprised if there were gross violations of human rights on all sides 
in Kosovo province, as took place in Bosnia before, and uh, uh, and in the other uh, conflicts that have arisen in uh, Yugoslavia uh, since 1990, 91-92. <coughs> but what is being taken? What is taking place? An incredible campaign of demonization of the Serbs, a one-sided attempt to project that the Serbs are the villains, even to suggest that they are not only madmen, and that Milosevic is a madman, but that they are actually uh, like uh, uh, Nazis, and that uh, Milosevic is like another Hitler, which, by the way, as for the reasons that I just referred to, really grates on the Serbian people, having fought and given their lives um, to fight the fascists. You know, 58 years ago, by the way, Hitler gave an ultimatum to Belgrade to surrender or else they would be bombed. And the Serbs uh, refused to uh, submit, and they were bombed uh, in April of uh, 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 58 years ago. And we're seeing a sad repetition of that. There's an interesting uh, comment that was made. But by the way, people have seen the sun today will know that on the uh, opinion page, the op-ed page, there are, are, are two very interesting articles precisely about the distorted nature of media coverage. But even those articles only <coughs> cover, you know, just deal with it in a superficial way. But there was a very interesting uh, comment made uh, recently, not too long ago, by Jean-Christophe Ruffin, who is the uh, former vice president of uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, that's the Doctors Without Borders organization. You know, these doctors that travel around the world and, and go into uh, 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 difficult areas where there's uh, conflict. And he wrote in Le Monde the following. He said that there are growing suspicions, especially in the third world, that, quote, the humanitarians could be the Trojan horse for new armed imperialisms. And that the argument of humanitarian uh, um, uh, intervention on the, on the basis of humanitarianism uh, 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 could and likely would be a ruse for overt um, imperialist plunder. And in fact, what we've seen is a, a crass and increasingly, however, apparent and transparent manufacturing of the news, particularly with respect to this war. It's an old tactic. It goes right back to uh, the days of Machiavelli. Uh, the Nazis used it to launch their assault on, uh, on Poland. You remember what happened there? That they said that they had to go into Poland because they had been attacked by the Poles who had crossed the border and attacked a radio station in Germany. And after the war, it came out that it was the Nazis themselves dressing up Nazi officers in Polish uniforms, attacking their own radio station, and then launching uh, uh, that as a, pre uh, as a pretext for the blitzkrieg against Poland. And of course, we, s we saw it in Vietnam, in the Gulf of Tonkin. And we saw it in Kuwait. As a matter of fact, there was a PR firm, Hill & Knowlton, uh, who it came out after the fact, had completely manufactured the story about the incubator babies. You remember this? You remember this, right? Those rotten, dirty, bestial Iraqis coming into a hospital in Kuwait and ripping out the incubators from the babies so that they could send them back to Baghdad and let these Kuwaiti babies uh, die. Who wouldn't want to go to war against uh, such an evil, uh, uh, evil regime? Totally manufactured, phony witnesses, the whole nine yards. Even Amnesty International was fooled. Whether they were fooled or whether they were collaborative, collaborating in it is an open question. But they had to admit later on that they were totally fooled and that they were used by US imperialism. So it came out, and a lot of risks were slapped. Isn't it terrible? She shouldn't possibly do this. Ethics and journalism have been grossly violated. But the damage had been done by that point. The assault had been launched against uh, uh, the uh, Iraqi regime. And this incident, this visual incident, powerful as it was, was used to mobilize public opinion in support of the war, or at least to neutralize it. 
And how about in Yugoslavia itself? Some of you will know this. I bet you lots of us know about this example of Sky TV and what they did in 1995 during the Bosnian Civil War, the so-called Serbian concentration camp. Do you remember that? Where they had the uh, uh, they had uh, elderly uh, Bosnian Muslims, elderly men, penned up in a Serbian concentration camp. But you saw the barbed wire and everything. It came out several years later by actually a German journalist who blew the story in an article called The Picture That Fooled the World, exposed the fact that these British journalists from Sky TV had found in Bosnia a, uh, a compound which was fenced in barbed wire, keeping out looters, and what was behind the fence was agricultural equipment, farm machinery and that the cameraman had got behind the barbed wire fence and had lined up the, this cast of elderly and somewhat emaciated um, uh, um, Bosnian uh, Muslim men and had filmed it and had marketed it as a Serbian concentration camp. Shame on them, how terrible, but the damage had been done and it was all directed towards villainizing the Serbs. At a time, precisely, when all other types of atrocities were being committed on all sides. When, for instance, the Croatian army in, in Bosnia had launched a bombardment of the city of Krajina and the region surrounding it, had bombarded the city, had killed hundreds and thousands of Serbs and driven the rest. Official reports said 130,000, but most uh, uh, most uh, uh, comments, uh, commentaries and from various experts said that it was actually much more than that. Upwards of a quarter of a million Serbs were driven from their homes and their homes were burnt and torched in an attempt to drive out uh, the Serbian population from that enclave in Bosnia. And earlier, e in Croatia itself, a similar thing had happened in the city of Penin. 100,000 Serbs driven out. In both of those cases, there was absolutely nothing done about it not even a protest note, not even a slap on the wrist to the Croatian government because it wasn't in the interest of imperialism. And so needless to say, there is an incredible amount of hypocrisy here. And while I'm on the topic of hypocrisy, it is uh, um, nothing short of unbounded, on infinite amount of hypocrisy involved in the very pretensions of imperialism to say that they want to stand up in defense of oppressed peoples and oppressed nations. It is unbelievable that they can do this. And they, of course, count on the very short memories, I guess, of people and lack of knowledge of history. I mean, who is NATO, after all? It is the co collection of the most powerful imperialist countries that in an earlier age plundered the entire world divided them up in colonies, oppressed the peoples, organized the slave trade, etc., 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 and carried out, by the way, in the case of the United States and Canada, policies of ethnic cleansing against the own or Aboriginal peoples and indigenous peoples. But you could say, well, that was centuries ago. Let's, you know. So NATO was founded in 1949 as a defensive shield to protect the free world from... Uh, from the big bad evil e uh, empire in the East. And presumably, with that justification, they did nothing. They turned a blind eye and, in fact, aided and abetted and financed and encouraged such notable Democrats as Salazar in Portugal, who plundered the peoples of Africa, not to mention uh, 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 the democratic forces and left forces in Portugal itself but the people in Mozambique, in Angola, in Guinea-Bissau, in Cape Verde. And what about the Greek, the regime of the Greek colonels? What about that? Nothing was done to stand up in defense of human rights and so on. And what about apartheid? And all the other, and all the other client uh, states that imperialism has aided and abetted. Did they ever threaten to bomb Pretoria? 
or Central America or South America, the Pinochet regime. There are endless examples. One interesting example uh, that comes to mind is the case of Guatemala. You know that there was a study done just very recently, an authoritative, well-researched study, which showed that of the over 100,000 people that perished during the Civil War in Guatemala, 80, 85% of whom were uh, native peoples, that 97% of those deaths were directly attributable to the actions of the military and of the regime which was financed and organized, and their troops and officers were trained in Miami and South Carolina and elsewhere, you, you know, the School of the, uh, the Americas and whatnot, in torture techniques and various other techniques to, to, uh, to oppress uh, uh, the people. And what about today? What about the situation in Turkey? I mean, if there's a case of, you know, vicious oppression of a national minority, Where, where else do you have to look? It's a NATO country. And imperialism has a, had a direct hand in helping to smash the, uh, uh, the, the, the leadership and the arrest of, uh, of uh, uh, Ocalan. And even the arrest of the lawyers that went to, to, to defend him. And in today, in Ankara, Ankara, it is illegal to stand up in the Turkish parliament, so-called House of Democracy, and utter a word in Kurdish. That's not national oppression, I don't know what is. And of course, again, no bombs, no cruise missiles, no uh, uh, withdrawal of ambassadors even. No protest notes, nothing. So for imperialism to, uh, uh, to now say that, well, well, you could say, well, okay, We've changed our stripes. You know, there were this, there were some people, for instance, after the uh, uh, or even before, there were there were those who argued that somehow imperialism is not uh, the same anymore. That it's changed its uh, stripes. That now that we've entered a new era uh, where we're in a post-imperialist world, and so perhaps imperialism has changed its stripes, and now it is coming rushing to the defense of oppressed peoples. But uh, don't hold your breath. <coughs> well, speaking about propaganda, how many of you had a chance to, uh, to do two things today? To pick up either the Sun or the Globe, and secondly, watch the news on television? Do both. What, stuck, what struck out today? What, I mean, what struck out in your minds today about that? Very interesting. I, I, won't, I won't put you on the spot. But anyway, what happened? Yesterday, there was this attack on the convoy of, of uh, civilian uh, refugees, killing how many? 84, last count, maybe over 100, and injuring hundreds more. <coughs> well, the first story from uh, NATO and from the, uh, uh, from the U.S. Uh, State Department and Defense uh, uh, Department, the Ministry of Propaganda and Information, was what? Well, no, we bombed the military, and then the Serbs turned around and killed the civilians to try to blame it on us. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Right? And if you look at the, star, uh, look at the, uh, the Vancouver Sun and the, uh, the Globe and Mail this morning, it's right there on the front page. The Serbs did it. And they even have found refugees to say, yes, there were MiGs who came and bombed us. By about noon this afternoon, uh, the, uh, the Americans, uh, unable to make that fly, have come out and announced that, in fact, well, we made a mistake. They looked like, uh, they looked like there were some tanks in there and so on, and we, uh, because, uh, you know, a tank and a tractor <laughs> carrying people, they kind of look the same. Anyway, uh, <coughs> but what does that say about the mass media, the role of the mass media? What does it say? Th th by the way, I'm going to speak about this later, but there was an interesting meeting also today uh, between Clinton and the editors of the main newspapers in the United States. They're having a conference, the National Association of Editors. Clinton was the was the featured speaker. I'm going to come back to that in a question, in a, in a second. But there is clearly direct collaboration between the corporate imperialist media, the mass media in our country, the opinion makers, and uh, and imperialism itself. 
And the latest, by the way, the latest is, because here they have a problem. Despite all of their overwhelming control of mass information, of CNN and so on, still some of the truth is leaking out. And one of the ways it's leaking out is through the Internet. Through the Internet. There is, um, any of you who have computers or wired into the Internet know that, that there's a lively debate going on and there's material being exchanged. Our party is using it extensively to circulate uh, information statements that are being issued and uh, analysis that's coming out about the war uh, very widely. And of course, there is a very, very lively exchange of information on the Internet, including, by the way, from Yugoslavia itself. And there are a number of websites now that have been set up by peace organizations and by the Serbian government and by uh, 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 Serbian peace organizations, which people on the web can go and visit. One is www.serbiainfo, I think that's the government one, and so on. There, there are a number of such websites. So what to do about this? This is very dangerous to imperialism because people are starting to hear the other side of the argument. So what arises? I don't know how many people have caught this, but there is now a big campaign being launched to say that the Serbs are using the internet that if you open up an email or you go and visit a website, you will be exposed to a very dangerous computer virus, which will get in your computer and <laughs> no, and and eat up your hard drive, and maybe do even worse things to you. Maybe blow up. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> right? So don't go there. Don't open anything or anything that looks even like it might be pro uh, peace or anti war. Um, this is very crass and transparent, and anybody who knows anything about computers and the internet will know that this is absolutely bogus and will see through it. And I think that they've, they've, they're already stopping that campaign because they're afraid it's going to backfire and that people are going to say, yeah, right, and but they will have the addresses of those websites and they will go and read what's on the websites, so they've decided that that wasn't such a smart tactic after all. But that is the length to which they will go to ensure that there is only one message that is given out, one doctored, manufactured mes message of the truth. But even if you were to believe that this is a humanitarian rescue mission and that there are tremendous uh, uh, crimes being committed against the minority Kosovo Albanians in Yugoslavia, It still begs the question, is bombing, is the launching of this aggression any solution to that problem? And people are also beginning to question on, on along those lines to say that, well, even if it, they're right, this is, this is making the situation much worse. It's inflaming the national uh, uh, enmity and hatred in the region, and it will have an effect not only for this year or this decade, but in fact for generations to come. And anyway, and I think that, that, w that we would all agree that there is Serbian nationalism, right-wing nationalism, which has been generated, as well as Croatian nationalism, and Albanian nationalism, and, Ser and, and uh, Slovenian nationalism, and Bosnian nationalism, and so on. But that begs another question. Who is responsible for the development and the proliferation of these reactionary nationalist I ideas in the first place? And the answer comes back again to imperialism. There is a Security Council decision directive from the 70s where the U.S. stated that their objective, particularly in the Balkans, particularly with respect to Yugoslavia, but elsewhere as well, Czechoslovakia and elsewhere, was to use the fact that these were multinational states to generate nationalist uh, 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 values and ideas and to aggravate any disparities that might exist and jealousies among the people that might exist precisely in order to weaken and undermine the socialist governments in those countries. That was their strategy and that's what uh, Radio Free Europe was all about and all those hundreds and thousands and millions of hours of broadcasting in Serbian and in Croatian and in Slovenian and other languages with that continuing message. Well, comrades and friends, 
there is a very real and very apparent danger in the present situation, a danger of escalation and the introduction of ground troops, which is, by the way, what the United States and the leading forces at this time within the U.S. ruling class uh, and the military-industrial complex are pr pressing for. Make no mistake about it. Regardless of you know their their uh, th their statements to the contrary, uh, there is a danger, a very real danger, that this conflict will widen and spread to adjoining countries, and that is also already happening. Albania and Mes Mes uh, Macedonia, and into Bosnia Herzegovina itself and elsewhere. There is a real danger of regional war and of a regional arms race. And there is a very real danger of a nuclear confrontation. I think everybody is painfully aware of the, of the, uh, of the fact that the people of Russia, peoples of Russia, and the Russian government, such as it is, and they have been pressured to say so precisely because of the feelings of the Russian people, are feeling increasingly threatened by this expansionist policy of NATO, which creeps ever closer to the Russian border, an objective which was always part of NATO, and I would contend still part of NATO's objective, and that Yeltsin was forced to come out and state that if the war escalates further into a ground war, that Russia and Russian government will be forced to change their policy with respect to non-involvement in, uh, non, uh, in this military conflict, and that Belarus has now asked the Russian government to reinstall nuclear warheads on their territory. And this is a very, very serious situation, comrades and friends. Very, very serious. And it goes well beyond the question of Serbia and Yugoslavia and Kosovo province and endangers the, the, the very future of uh, humanity. But it's just possible, it's just possible that imperialism doesn't, isn't all that concerned about it. Sure, they would like to neutralize the Russians. Sure, they would like to, uh, to ensure that the Russians, in this particular case, stay neutral. But for instance, the Russian government has said that it is freezing its participation in the start two negotiations to limit nuclear uh, warheads and actually to lead to the destruction of nuclear warheads. Is imperialism worried about that? I would like to suggest to you that in fact that's exactly what imperialism wants. They want another round of the arms race. It's good for business. There's a very interesting article in this regard, by the way, in the recent issue of Covert Action Quarterly, which is a incredibly expensive publication, by the way, <laughs> but nonetheless, a very, very interesting article talking, amongst other things, about the companies that produce the cruise missiles and the fact that they're coming out with a whole new generation of cruise missiles and that the current cruise missiles, which are at the disposal of uh, U.S. imperialism, are obsolete and that instead of just throwing them away, better to use them, better to fire them off. And in any case, um, that just means that uh, there will be more appropriations for more money to build more me weapons of mass destruction. And isn't that what Clinton did yesterday? Going and asking for, uh, for another appropriation for more arms spending. And that is the tick tip of the iceberg, uh, comrades and friends. So what are the real reasons for this NATO aggression, this imperialist aggression against Yugoslavia, if it's not for humanitarian reasons, what are the objectives of imperialism? Well, I'd like to suggest to you that there are many reasons. First of all, they want to complete the dismantling of Yugoslavia itself and what remains of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, Serbia primarily. It's not a socialist country anymore. But having said that, Neither is it a willing client state of, uh, of uh, the transnationals and the World Bank and the IMF. There is still a very substantial public sector there. There is still uh, opposition to, um, to the penetration 
uh, of, uh, of of foreign uh, transnationals and uh, and so on. And there is still a very strong left in Serbia. But it goes well beyond that. Imperialism, especially the United States imperialism, wants to create a long-term basis for their continuation, their raison d'etre in Europe, and particularly in the Balkans. And by ensconching themselves in, in the Balkans, will guarantee that their uh, reason for being is extended. This is important, amongst other reasons, because there's a struggle going on behind the scenes between the United States and between European capital. Just yesterday we saw a good reflection of that. Germany is trying to find some way out. Why? Because they're social democrats? No. Hardly. Because there's social democrats in Britain who don't have the same approach. But German imperialism, and you know within the European Union there has been quite a debate recently about forming an all-European army in Europe. And it's because European imperialism, led by the Germans, aren't comfortable with the presence of the United States and the hegemony of the US in Europe and in North Africa and in the Middle East. And they want to supplant US imperialism. And the Americans are very anxious to head that off and prevent it from happening. And the best way to do that is to ensure that NATO stays uh, and U.S. Uh, hegemony in NATO stays in Europe. As I said before, they also want to test their weapon systems, the F-2, uh, the uh, B-2 bomber, uh, stealth bomber, and so on. And they are anxious to stimulate a whole new round of the arms race. That explains their increasing belligerence to China, the People's Republic of China, and what, it, what we see happening in uh, the subcontinent between India and Pakistan. All of these developments, as dangerous as they are, uh, will feed an incredibly wasteful and expensive new round of the arms race. For those of you who thought, by the way, that the uh, disappearance of the Soviet Union, uh, is whatever we thought about that, uh, the, the one benefit would be the peace dividend and the, the de-escalation of uh, the war threat uh, are sadly uh, finding that uh, quite the contrary is taking place in the world. But <coughs> there's other reasons as well. Imperialism wants to use Yugoslavia as an example to countries everywhere, to peoples everywhere, that if you cross us, if you resist us, you will be smashed. And it's a very uh, vivid example, isn't it, for peoples elsewhere. Doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that it'll be effective, but that's what its intention is. But I think, comrades and friends, that it even goes deeper than that. What we are witnessing right now is the elaboration of a whole new set of international relations in the post-Cold War, War period in which the U.S. presents itself, sometimes on its own, sometimes with Britain as an ally, its staunchest ally, sometimes using NATO, as the sole superpower in the world. I mentioned earlier that Clinton had spoken to the editors, the main editors of the big press in the United States today. What he said was very interesting. Essentially, and I can't quote him here, but this is the essence of what he said. He said that there is a new epoch, a new order in the world for the 21st century, for the next millennium, in which the principle of non-intervention is a thing, a relic of the past, and that the international community will have the right to intervene wherever, it feels necessary. And you might say, well, that's the international community. But what is the international community? Is it Russia? Is it China? Is it India? China and India, the two most populated countries in the world, both oppose this. So I guess they're not part of the international community. And Russia's not part of the international community. Most of the Latin American countries and African countries aren't part of the international community. So what is this so-called international community? 
it is a very, very dangerous development. It's an attempt to consolidate a political and military and strategic infrastructure to guarantee the domination of global and particularly U.S. monopoly capital. And it is the political counterpart of globalization, isn't it? So what is to be done? Well, in Canada, first of all, and I, I, I know that I'm going a little bit over time here, but I want to say that in Canada, the Canadian people are posed with the question of mobilizing as much as possible the movement against the war. In this respect, I'm going to say something about Parliament and the shameful role that the, our government has played. You know, before the war, Chrétien said, well, let's not have a real debate in Parliament about it because it's all hypothetical. And after the war started, he said, let's not have a debate about it because we have to rally behind our troops. Um, but what about the other parties? What about reform, which is falling over itself to show that it is the staunchest, the most redneck, the most militant um, uh, bootlicker of U.S. imperialism in Canada. And they're doing a pretty good job of it, by the way, <laughs> if you hear some of those speeches. And what about the Bloc Québécois? How incredibly uh, short-sighted and, and reactionary of the Bloc Québécois to think that, well, if imperialism can intervene there, maybe they'll come in and, 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 and bomb Toronto if we separate uh, in Quebec. <laughs> what foolishness. What arrogant foolishness. And what of social democracy in the New Democratic Party? I understand that uh, Alexa McDonough and Sven Robinson made an interesting statement uh, yesterday to the effect that perhaps the bombing has gone too far and perhaps a break is needed. They're taking their cue, uh, no doubt, from the German Social Democratic Party. And they've spoken up against sending more CF-18s to the region. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. They are to be applauded. But where were they three weeks ago? Where were they three weeks ago? When at a critical moment, at a critical moment, when it was important to stand up and take a principled position against this aggression, what did they do? They caved in to the interests of imperialism and in the most crass, opportunist way. And they will pay a high political price for that. Already people are ripping up their NDP membership cards, and with good reason. We don't make a mistake, you know, we understand who the main enemy is here. It's imperialism, and in the first place, U.S. imperialism. And the, in the first place, the core of U.S. imperialism grouped around the military-industrial complex. That's the main enemy. But what a shameful display that we've witnessed in the past several weeks. And even on Monday, they had a chance to try to rectify, and yet they didn't, did they? There are developments that are taking place here and elsewhere. I've been traveling across the West. There are mobilizations. There was a demonstration last Sunday in uh, Winnipeg of uh, about 500 people. It was a good start there. There's actions planned in Edmonton and elsewhere. And right here in Vancouver, I understand that there's going to be a big demonstration this Sunday. It ought to be a big demonstration, and every one of us should leave this room, you know, uh, determined to get. 10 other people that we know out to that demonstration, or 20 or 30, and build it as, as aggressively and as, uh, as urgently as we possibly can. Furthermore, I understand, and the arms race has decided that there will be a, a peace demonstration on May Day. And what a more appropriate theme for May Day this year than to march for peace and against this war. I think it's very important that whatever is done here and whatever is done in small towns and smaller centers, that we document all of this and that we let people know about what's going on. Part of this propaganda campaign is precisely to give the impression that we're somehow the only ones who don't like this war. There are hundreds of thousands of people marching in Europe as we speak. In Greece, they have had massive demonstrations. At the Aviano base in Italy, the Communist Refoundation and other peace forces have had demonstrations in the thousands, in the tens, in the hundreds of thousands. 
In Paris, there have been demonstrations, and the French Communist Party, to their credit, has been uh, very active in mobilizing the anti-war movement there. In London and elsewhere in Britain, there are big demonstrations in the face of the collusion of the Blair Social Democratic government. Shame on them, too. So it's very important that we let one another know what's going on in this fight back and build this sense that we're not alone, that there is a tremendous opposition uh, to this war and we can prevent this war. And internationally, there is a need to bring together particularly the communist and revolutionary forces in the world around this whole new situation which has arisen, a very, very dangerous situation. And I'm pleased to tell you that there has been a conference, it was actually already being in, in the planning stages, a conference of Communist and Workers' Party to be held in Athens in, on May 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, so in about one month. And there will be 80 to 100 Communist and Workers' Parties from right around the world at that conference. And our party has decided that we must be at that conference and we must build a united international movement against it. Well, comrades and friends, I have spoken a lot about the war obviously because our party considers it to be the number one priority right now. But I also want to draw certain other, qu quickly, certain other things to your attention. I was in Regina on Saturday. I was actually there on Friday. I spoke on campus. Somebody from the uh, Regina Leader Post came up and interviewed me, asked me what we thought about the nurses' strike and their decision to defy this legislation. By the way, from another New Democratic friend of the Working People Party, of Roy Romano. You know, I'd been in Newfoundland earlier, you know, when the, when, uh, the Liberal Party uh, uh, passed back to work order against the, the Newfoundland nurses, but at least they waited four days in, in Saskatchewan when they didn't even wait one hour before they legislated them back to work and tried to break their strike. But nonetheless, they are united, they are militant. When the injunction came down on that Saturday past, they were at the courthouse, and by the way, our comrades in, in Regina, the club there was organized, came out and was uh, there with them, along with workers from every union, every union was out there in support of those nurses, and the situation now is moving towards a general strike in the province. If, if the government does not retreat and provide funding for decent wages, decent conditions for these workers who have taken it like all other workers in this country on the chin for years and have been forced to have had concession after concession after concession wrung from them for years and finally they're standing up and saying enough is enough we won't take it anymore and so they're to be congratulated we should do everything possible in the labor, labor movement here and labor councils and elsewhere to build solidarity with those heroic and courageous nurses who are facing fines and imprisonment of their entire leadership uh, as, as we speak. But that is just one reflection, maybe the sharpest to date uh, in the recent period, but just one reflection of a changing mood among workers. We see it in, uh, in, in Ontario and Quebec as well with the Bell strike, MTS workers, there's struggles going on everywhere in this country. And the biggest problem, of course, is the question of leadership in the labor movement. And in a few weeks' time, there's going to be a, uh, a very important convention of the Canadian Labour Congress. And I'd like to tell you that when the CLC convenes on May 3rd, and when the elections are held a few days later, it's going to result in a, in a, in a sharp turn to the left. But I can't tell you that. And you know why. Because your loss, or your gain, I should say, your gain is the, is the labour movement in Canada's loss. Your gain in getting rid of Giorgetti is going to be the loss for the entire labor movement in this country. But the fact is, no, he's not. That's the point. Well, listen up, Harry. <laughs> the fact is, however, that for the first time in many years, since at least the 80s, Certainly for over a decade, for the first time, there is not only going to be a left at that convention, but an organized left. And the Action Caucus, which played an important role in mobilizing uh, uh, and organizing left forces uh, in the labor movement for a number of years, and was killed, didn't die on its own right, but was killed, you know how it was killed, 
has been resurrected, and there will now be an action caucus at this convention, which will include uh, a number of uh, left unions and left unionists. The party will have a bigger party contingent at this convention than it's had in over a decade. Uh, and uh, we think that there's going to be a very important advance for the left forces coming out of this, uh, this convention, if not reflected on the executive, but certainly in the fight around policy, for more militant, more class struggle policies, uh, rather than the policy of betrayal and of class collaboration and of concessions, which we've seen from leading bodies of the labor movement for too many years. Finally, I want to say just a, a tiny word about the other struggle that our party's been involved in, and of course that's the struggle for democracy. I think everybody in this room knows about the uh, judgment that came down by Justice Malloy one month ago, a very important victory for our party, but not only for our party, for all smaller parties and for the struggle for democracy, even within the narrow confines of bourgeois democracy, and even a small part of that, but nonetheless an important, important struggle that we have waged and which we have won at least the first round of. I want to tell you the latest, actually, actually those of you who have read uh, the Globe and Mail, for some reason is actually being friendly to us. I don't think it'll last, <laughs> but they have been friendly on this question. That the government uh, on Monday or Friday last announced that they are appealing the decision, but they're only appealing part of the decision, and that those uh, orders in the decision which they're not appealing have been now won outright. And they are now the law of the land. And what they're not appealing is the following. They are not appealing the ruling which struck down the unlawful seizure of our assets and the assets of deregistered parties. So that has now been declared unconstitutional. We have won that, comrades and friends. <laughs> And there's another important thing which they are not appealing, which is also an outright win. And that is uh, the ju uh, Justice Malloy's decision that the $1,000 deposit that candidates have to put up, you know, before it was uh, only 500 of it would come back and the other 500 wouldn't be refundable unless you got over 15% of the vote. She struck that down, which means that candidates will now, and parties now, will get the full $1,000 back uh, uh, after the election. Uh, they haven't appealed that, which means we've won that as well, not only for our party, but for other smaller parties. <laughs> and what they have appealed is the 50-candidate rule, which was struck down to two. And uh, um, I want to tell you that uh, we've had discussions with our legal counsel, with uh, Peter and with, uh, with others. I want to talk with Harry about this, by the way, when we get a chance. That we're very confident that we will win that point as well on appeal. And if it requires that we go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, we're going to do that. Uh, and so finally, comrades and friends, I want to end here by, by just recapping. Because I think that this period has been, been seminal for a number of reasons. Seminal not only because it has taught very bitter lessons about the world we live in, and the class relations that exist in this world, in this country, right here in Vancouver, and particularly about the growing danger which exists for working people and for, for all people uh, fighting for justice and democracy and social advance and liberation and whatnot. But it's also been seminal in terms of saying something about politics in this country and particularly about our party. Because our party, and you know, sometimes I get asked by reporters, they say, on this question of democracy, they say, isn't it, isn't it <coughs> ironic? Isn't it funny that it's the communists who are fighting for democracy? And of course we say, well, that's not funny at all. We've, we've been fighting for democratic rights and labor rights ever since we were founded 78 years ago. But that it's the communist party that has been fighting and putting up uh, and, and playing a leading role in the struggle for democracy in this period. And that on the question of the war, it's the Communist Party which has taken a clear, principled, anti-imperialist line and a line for peace. And that on the question of the way forward for labor, it's the Communist Party and only the Communist Party which is advancing a clear policy and analysis based on class struggle. And I could go on, 
that it's the Communist Party, it's the only party that's fighting uh, against the loss of Canadian sovereignty and continuing to fight against free trade and NAFTA and so on, where that fight has been abandoned by others. And in BC, I better add one other thing, that it's the Communist Party, and only the Communist Party that has an unequivocal position in defense of the people's common heritage to our natural resources, to our forests, to our oil and our water, and so on. And we won't accept any privatization of that common legacy. So on a whole number of fronts, I think that uh, this experience, as difficult as trying as it is, is also helping to clarify questions. I hope it is for people, militant people, principled people, people who are moving to the left, about what are the differences are and what, what kind of party the Communist Party is. And so I want to invite all of you, many of you I know are already readers of the People's Voice, but if you're not a reader of the People's Voice, read the People's Voice. Subscribe to our press. Help to build it and get into the hands of, of uh, more people, especially working people. And if you're not a member of the party, I want to also extend an invitation to join our party and help to build our party, because the party uh, is the future. The working class and its party is the future. And uh, as dark as sometimes it seems, under a halo of uh, bursting bombs and cruise missiles, um, uh, the future uh, is with the working class. The future is with socialism. So thank you very much for being so attentive. And it was less than four hours. I want to bring to your attention. <laughs> but thank you very much.